Nicholas Szyszanowski from the University of Łódź, Poland. Uh, or maybe if I may say, uh, we see Since we are friends, right? <laughs> we see this uh, a master in physics uh, from the University of Łódź. Uh, after that, he went to uh, a company in the US, CLD Research uh, Company. Yeah. yeah. Which were doing rocket science with semiconductor lasers, if I understood it. <laughs> uh, to afterwards go back to the University of Łódź to do his PhD uh, with Professor Wojciech Nagwaski uh, on modeling of semiconductor lasers. He particularly worked, very nice work, on uh, scalar and vectorial approaches to optical fields and semiconductor lasers and applications. And for, uh, for this very nice PhD, he was, was awarded afterwards uh, an outgoing fellowship from the uh, Polish state uh, to do his uh, postdoc at the Freie Universität in Brussels, uh, working with uh, Kasimir Panagatov. That's also the period when we met uh, in Brussels. We had exactly the same time staying there uh, at the university. And afterwards, Komek uh, went back to Łódź uh, to and became on uh, got his habilitation in 2012, so last year, and was appointed professor. And uh, he's working uh, now in modeling and the design of uh, these arrays and of uh, axles, so vertical external cavity surface emitting lasers. And today, he's going to tell us about his works on single mode emission of these arrays and how to achieve. And maybe how to destroy it again. Yeah. <laughs> very happy to have you here. Thank he's you. not only uh, an excellent scientist, he's also a very good friend. And anyone uh, who uh, uh, tries to play squash should dare challenge him for a match. <laughs> yeah, Ingo was a very tough opponent in, in Brussels, so we were really f doing those fights German against Poland in squash <laughs> and in tennis too. <coughs> So very, very, very Thank you. Thank you. So I only mentioned to that what, what you already said so kindly on me, that we are also working on high contrast gratings, which are uh, new structures which are which are uh, right now used. Uh, they are trying to be used in, in pixels instead of DPRs. So we are re replacing those bulky DPRs with high contrast gratings, which are a uh, few nanometers thick and they give a very broad re reflection spectrum. So, and it's also very interesting, it's also a very interesting structure because it introduces the lateral confinement. So it does not only confines in the, in the line, in the axis, but also it confines from the lateral sides. But today I'm, I'm, I'm going to, to, to tell you a little bit on the uh, pixel arrays and I must say that I'm very much confused because I already visited Ingo's lab and we are already working on arrays which consist like 64 pixels. And I'm going to present the results only on, on three pixels in the array. So please forgive me that, that I'm giving such a, a simple <laughs> approach. <coughs> and my work was mostly driven by by the group from, from Lausanne. So, as you probably know, they are uh, manufacturing such, such pixels, such pixel arrays. And the main driven engine was to design a, a, a pixel array for, for spectroscopy. So, to have a, a small device which can, which can easily detect some, uh, some gases and they would like to do it with, with, with pixel arrays. So the, the main idea was very simple, to design a pixel which gives a single mode emission and of course a high power. Right? So it, it was two issues with which we would like to face and also important was to have a beam which is not divergent. So we wanted to have a beam which is emitted with a, with a small angle. So it was our three very simple aims, our three goals, which we wanted to face, which we wanted to design such a, such a laser. Okay, so I give you a, a short introduction and motivation. 
I uh, say a few words on the on the on the model and the structure because I'm a, 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 maybe not theoretician, but I, I, I like to say that I'm a mostly designer, so I'm using the numerical methods for designing the pixels for lasers. And then we s we go to the results. So uh, few words on thermal and electrical simulations, which are not a big deal. And then I will say on optical uh, results for for three different designs of pixel arrays. And I will not tell what are those designs right now. Do not destroy the whole story. So we will find it out later. Why pixels are so, so difficult comparing to etchemeters? Because in pixels, you want to have emission in the same axis as injecting of the current. Right? And if you inject the current, you need to have some contacts. And the contacts are strongly absorptive for the light. So you cannot cover the top and the bottom mirror of the, of the pixel with the, with the contacts which would be very nice for distribution of the current because then you can easily inject the current to the, to the pixel. So you have to make a window for, for, the, for the optics, which means that you have to shift the, 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 uh, the contacts outside of the axis of the, of the pixel, and that makes uh, big problems because then you have to force somehow the current to go through the center the laser where it can interact with the optics. So it's very important and difficult issue for, for, for the pixel. So we can deal with it with uh, uh, selective uh, oxidation of, uh, of, uh, of one layer, which introduces like a insulator for, for, for the current. And also it gives a waveguide uh, effect which can confine the light. But this is only in, in arsenides. Uh, in other, in other uh, materials, that's, that's, that's more tricky and uh, uh, to get the confinement, it is of, often, quite often used uh, the, the proton implantation or you can also introduce some uh, tunnel junction which can also funnel the current. So, so the funneling the current to the center of the pixel is a very important issue and it's very difficult still right now because what current does? Current goes that way, and it wants to go with the shortest way from, from one contact to the another contact, and then you can see the typical distribution of the current which shows the, the current crowding. So, so you have a lot of current here on the sides of the aperture, and you want to have light in the center. Mostly you would like to have a fundamental mode emission, which means that the, that the maximum uh, optical power is here. So it's not in the same place where you have a high current. So typically, to confine the current and the light in arsenide pixels, you are using the, the offside aperture. So this is the, the, the region where you have a lower refractive index, and this is also the <coughs> insulator. So you are injecting the current here, not like that. However, to achieve a high power, because what we want to have for the spectroscopy, you want to have a high power and you want to have a single mode emission, a lateral single mode emission, because in the pixel, the longitudinal single mode emission is not the cause of the design. However, if you introduce a high refractive index contrast between center and the lateral sides, you can find many modes. So that means that if you want to have a high power, you would like to increase your optical aperture. Increasing the optical aperture makes that many modes goes to that aperture, and you can excite many modes. So this is this is the, the, the uh, dependence of the emitted wavelength against the aperture, quite close to the to the threshold. So that means that to have a single mode operation, you need to design your aperture, which is like four microns. If you are increasing the aperture then even in the threshold, close to the threshold, you will have many modes. Right? So going to 12, which, is, which can give a relatively high power, you, you, you can forget on the single mode operation. You will have many lateral modes. 
So it seems that the mm, a, a nice idea to achieve a single mode operation is to confine is to confine the current, but not confine the light at the same time. Because if you are not confining the light, that means that you will have a fundamental mode which overlaps the center of the, of the laser, and any higher order modes will have their maxima out of the uh, axis. So that means that you can like extract the fundamental mode, and any other modes will suffer high losses, and they will be no not exciting. So such structure can, was was designed and, and already measured in the group of Eli Capone. So they confined the current with a uh, tunnel junction. So you introduce here like a, like a gate for the for the current. Current can go only here. The tunnel junction is introduced in the node position of a standing wave. That means that it does not interact with the field. So we have here some refractive index contrast, which is around 0 0.2. However, it is in the node position. So that means that it almost does not in interact with the field. So it does not introduce any optical confinement. Only one optical confinement in, in such a structure comes from the thermal focusing. So if you introduce the current, you increase the temperature in the center. If you increase the temperature in the center, then you change also the refractive index. So you have a slightly higher refractive index here in the center than outside of the, of the center. So it somehow it introduces the, 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 the thermal focusing, the, the light, and confine the, the, the modes. However, it's very very weak uh, phenomena, so you can so you can confine fundamental mode and maybe also some first or second mode. However, those uh, structures provide probably record emission in the single mode uh, operation, and both are the lasers for 1.3, 1.5. So I was basing on that kind of structure. So what we wanted to do, we wanted to have a single mode operation, but more power. If more power, that means that we wanted to have more emitters. And this is why air rays appear. Um, <coughs> some initial uh, experimental, uh, experimental results uh, done by, by Lucas Mutter are shown here. And well, if you increase the number of emitters, you of course increase the, the emitter power. That's, that's clear. However, the spectrum is not any more single mode. So that's, that, that's one issue. We are losing by the single mode operation. So there appears some lateral modes of, of <coughs> higher range. And also what you see here, this is the uh, uh, near field emission, and this is a far field emission, which shows that probably you have some emission which is out of phase which means that we have many modes here. However, those are not the modes which uh, interfere in a nice way, which I will show in a moment, in a far field. So they produce some images for rather large angles. So, so we are getting the beam like that. OK, here we have. So there is one more information. Here we have uh, modes, uh, some experimental modes, which we, which we can observe in the uh, in the arrays. There are some approaches to, to, to classifying the modes in the in the arrays. However, I would like to keep the most simple classification as, as possible. I'm just counting the number of 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 of, of minima between the loads. Uh, sorry, I'm counting, I'm counting the lobes in x direction and y direction. So if we have uh, one lobe, that means that this is our epsilon 1, 1 mode. Here we have two lobes in that direction, so this is epsilon 1, because here we have only one lobe, and in that direction we have two lobes, so this is epsilon 1, 2. Uh, that guy here is epsilon 2, 3, because in that direction we have two lobes, and in that direction we have three lobes. So we what, what we want to have, to, to have an efficient design, we want to have the lobes which are in the same place where are our emitters. 
then we have effective interaction between photons and particles. And we can uh, extract as high power as it's possible. So we call such a mode array mode. So this is the one which overlaps, which, which distribution of a mode uh, overlaps with, with our emitters, which we also call pixels. Uh, we have another approach to achieve a single mode emission and high power. Both are backsets, right? But what's wrong about backsets? We need a, a additional pumping laser. So that, that makes the whole device very bulky. So you have, to, you have to imagine that you have a, a pump laser, then you have some uh, optics to co collimate the beam, and you, then you have your, your, your vessel and also the output coupler. So in, in com the, the commercial device is it's, it's, it's rather bulky. It's, it's a big device. So what we can achieve with, with arrays, what we can achieve with arrays is that, that maybe we do not produce as high power as it is with vexels. However, that's very compact design. Right? So, so we can, we can uh, uh, make such a design for, for industry and put them somewhere where some uh, uh, gases can, be, uh, can escape, I don't know, from, from, from some whatever. It's, 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 it, 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 it should be cheap and, and very simple uh, device comparing to, to vexels. So vexels can produce. So in vexels, due to the due to their geometry, is very easy to achieve a single uh, lateral mode because you have that output coupler. Okay. So you can tune with with that output coupler, and you can you can choose the lateral modes. So in particular case, you can choose just a fundamental mode, lateral fundamental mode. However, here you have a very long cavity, which means that you have many longitudinal modes. Of course, you can extract those modes, introducing here an atom, like a resonator. So you can extract only one longitudinal mode. It's, it's, it's possible because, because of the design. And of course, it gives a huge power. These are not milliwatts, those are watts. Completely different. But what we want? We want a compact, low cost solution. Right? And of course, what we are interested in is a moder moderate electric power consumption. Uh, narrow line weight, that's the, due to the sing uh, single longitudinal mode, because that's, that's the inherent uh, 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 issue which is for, for the pixels. And what are the problems? There are two, two main problems. It's, it's difficult to uh, achieve single, single uh, transversal mode. We have many transversal modes. And also the problem is to achieve a in-phase super mode operation. What is typical for, for, for arrays of pixels is that we have out-of-phase operation, which produces that, that divergence. So why we have the divergence? Let's imagine that we have uh, three emitters, like, like, in a, uh, like in a pixel arrays, and we have a mode. This is the distribution of this is not the distribution of the light, but this is the distribution of the electric field of the light. Right. So here we have let's let's call that here we have a plus, here we have a minus, here here we have a plus. So this is both two lobes are like out of phase. So here in the far field we will not get a, 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 a nice interference between those lobes because that one is going to shadow that one, right? because they have a, a, a different, different phases. So where are we going to get a nice image? We are going to get a nice image here, because here they fulfill the, the condition of the uh, nice interference. Here we are going to, 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 to achieve in the far field a uh, strong image. So that's why we are getting the, the two bulbs in the far field for, for the arrays. It's like here. So what we what we have to do to have a nice image, but not two lobes, but only one lobe, we have to somehow decrease that lobe. Okay. But if we decrease that lobe, so that means that we are losing the currents which are in that emitter. So what else can we do? 
we can we are we have to look for such kind of amounts. So we have uh, in phase lobes in the error in the in the pixels and some small lobes in, in the between. Why small? Because here we don't have a current. We do not inject the current here, so that means that we have absorption there. If we have absorption then there, then our design is not very electrically uh, is not very efficient. And in such a case here in the far field we can get a nice image. Alright, so what we are looking, we are looking for those kinds of modes like that. And in, in, uh, in the way how I call those modes, I'm looking for epsilon 1, 5, 1, 9, 1, 14, 1, 7, 1, 7, and so on and so on. Right? So what I want to have, I want to have a lobes in those emitters which are in phase. So for that, for, for searching, for looking for such a modes, I'm, 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 I'm using the uh, numerical model. Uh, which simulates the operation of, of lasers, particularly here, I simulate the pixels and uh, the arrays. And this is not any more pixel, so we don't have any more a uh, cylindrical uh, coordinate system to to, uh, to simulate such a device. But we have a, we have to apply here a Cartesian coordinate system, and and there is not not many symmetry. In such a design. So to that we need to apply here fully three-dimensional model. So what we have, we need to have a three-dimensional optics, we need to have three-dimensional thermal model and electrical model. And again, but again this is not a big deal. Big deal is optics, uh, thermal model and electrical model, everything three-dimensional. So it, it makes the calculations very time consuming. So if, if you are interested, here, here there are the details of the, of the models, and everything is is uh, 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 um, uh, uh, combined in self-consistent way with a diffusion model in, in the active region. Okay. So. Well, to, to, to uh, simulate it very carefully and uh, to, to assume all the interactions between the models, we should apply, we should use such a model in the loop. But the calculation time is very different and you see that the uh, calculation time of the temperature and, 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 electric and, and current distribution in, in our model, it's like one, two days. The model is based on the uh, 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 finite element, so it's very... Uh, uh, so for that, we, we really need a huge arrays, huge, huge matrices, and that's why it's not very efficient. Comparing to the optical model, which in our case, this is a three-dimensional, however, in one dimension, we are using the uh, analytical approach. So that makes the, 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 the optical model very fast and we can use it because we are uh, 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 our model is a plane wave evidence method so we assume the plane wave distribution of the modes in the lateral uh, uh, direction and due to the axis we have the um, analytical evidence method which does, uh, which we have to assume the uh, <coughs> continuum of, of uh, our solution and also uh, uh, derivatives of our solution. So this is more or less like, like in the transfer matrix method. However, this is for 3D, so, it's, it's, so we are playing with, 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 with the arrays. Okay, so it shows that the whole model is, is very complex and it's very time consuming. So what I'm doing to, to, to get a, a results in the, final, in the final time is that I'm applying the self-consistency only to the temperature and current distribution. So thanks to that I'm, I'm getting the distribution of the current and distribution of the temperature. That I'm using to, to calculate the optics. So I do not that, that loop to, 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 to find the emitted power. 
So that's why I have to use some other parameters, but not emitted power, because I'm not able to calculate. So I will show you which param parameter I'm, I'm, I'm using to, uh, to classify which, uh, which, which pixels are put on. Because the easiest way it would be just to calculate what is the emitted power in the single mode operation. That would be a straightforward answer. However, I'm not able to calculate it because it's too complicated for us. But. And here we have some typical distribution of the carrier concentration in the in the active region. So this is what we can calculate, and this is some distribution of the of the temperature. However, details will be in the moment. Mm. So, this is the parameter which I'm using. So, I'm not, not calculating the emitted power, but I'm calculating the model gain of, of different modes. And what I assume, I assume that if I calculate the model gain for the fundamental mode and any other modes, and if I see that the difference due to the model gain is large between fundamental mode and first order mode, so I can expect that such laser is single mode laser. So if we increase the difference between fundamental and first order mode due to the model gain, we can expect that this is a single mode operator, that this is a single mode design. So what is the what is the model gain? The model gain, this is the gain or absorption in the whole laser which is integrated with the uh, 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 intensity of the light. And we divide it by, by, by such an integral. Of course, that's, that's, some, uh, 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 that's some approaching formula because we calculate it from, from our model just directly from the optical model. And to achieve a high model gain, we need to uh, we need to uh, uh, assure that our distribution of the mold is in the uh, in the place where we have a high high gain. So so for example, if we have a mold which is like that here and here, our model gain will be very low because here we have a high absorption. Mm -hmm. Just so quick, you have a lesson coupling between the molds here in the, in the semiconductor material, correct? Yeah, of course, of course, right, right, right. Because right now I'm I'm, I'm considering it like a like an emitter, right? Mm -hmm. So I don't have any separate modes here. That's that's one mode. You can call it. This close to the right. Is this vertical? Then to the right. Uh, the the axis here. Yeah. Okay. So so. Uh, uh, um, Okay, yeah, maybe go here. So what we saw here, it was the distribution of the optical field here. <coughs> Sorry. This is that guy, but this is a logarithmic scale, right? Because if we not use the logarithmic scale, then we can see only the, uh, the distribution of the field here, right? And here, this is, this is that plane. <coughs> All right, and our 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 model was confronted with with experimental results just to uh, tune some some parameters which are not sure about it from 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 the publication because as you probably know numerical models need some 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 parameters and not all of them are, are very well known. So thanks to that collaboration with EPFL, we could extract many of them and make that our model shows more or less the, the, the characteristics which are also observed in the experiment. So we can expect that our results are somehow connected to the real life. I'm not saying that they are ideally it's exa exactly the same as in the, real, in the real life, but we can expect that we can have some uh, 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 it's close. All right, so our first design is like that. Uh, here we have uh, contacts on the left and right side, so this is the inje injection like here. Here we have a tunnel junction. So the current goes through the tunnel junction, it goes through the active region, and goes here. On the top and the bottom we have a DZRs. This is the 1.3 micrometer pixel, which is based on the uh, uh, 
a TNP material. The DBRs are just glue to the, to the cavity because the DBRs are arsenide based. That's because of that that it's very difficult to do uh, efficient DBRs for, for, for that kind of the materials. Typically, uh, uh, based on INP DBRs, they should need like, I don't know, 50 pairs of DBRs to, to produce the effective reflectivity of, of 98% or something like that. So they are using the uh, wafer bound, bounding just to glue the arsenide DBRs to ENT based uh, mixes. And here, in that plane, we have three tunnel junctions. Right? So they are here. Those are three tunnel junctions. So we have we have a contact here. If you if you see from the from the top, we have contact here. This is that contact. We have contact here. This is that contact. And the current goes like that. So thanks to that, we are getting very uh, nice distribution of the current in each emitter. It's it's very uniform. So this is the example result of the distribution of the current. In those three emitters, if the distance between the emitters is 0 0.1, it's so it's, it's very small uh, distance. So that means that it is almost like single emitter uh, mixer. If we increase the distance, right now this is four, four micrometers, so you can see those emitters separately. But you also see that the current, the maximum. Uh, uh, carrier concentration in the in the emitters is almost the same. But what what else is doing the tunnel ju junction? <coughs> the tunnel junction has very high effective uh, resistivity, so that uniforms the, the, the current, and it's very difficult to observe the current crowding in tunnel junction. So you need like a, I, I I saw the experimental results. So you need like a uh, aperture of 25 or 40 microns to observe the uh, uh, current crowding, right? which in oxide apertures it appears, I don't know, in 8 microns or something. So if we increase, we if we increase the distance between the emitters, we can see clearly the separation between between those emitters due to the concentration of the uh, of the carriers. What about temperature distribution? Because if you inject the current to the, to the emitters, you have a recombination here, which is not only the recombination which produces the photons, but also it produces phonons, which means that you hit the, 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 the structure, right? So if the distance between the emitters is not very large, then we observe a distribution of the temperature, which is also typical for the single emitter, broad area single emitter. If you increase the distance between them, then you can see clearly that you have three different emitters. And of course, what you observe is that you are lowering the temperature because you are separating the, 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 the emitters. So the uh, heat is not concentrated in, 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 in one place, but it, it is distributed. So the heat can more easily escape from the, from the active. So what we can expect is that the uh, thermal focusing for such an array is weaker if distance between the emitters is large. OK. So what produces the, the, car the carrier distribution and the temperature distribution? Here, this is the refractive index against the lateral position. So we are, we are, we are tracking what's happening to the refractive index in that direction. So, in the active region, we have three carriers. Right? There is a very lot of them. If we have a carriers, so the carriers, it should be, sorry, it should be minus. It should be minus here. If we have carriers, the carriers, the carriers lowers the refractive index. So, if you have more carriers, then you more lowers the refractive index. So, this is the distribution of the refractive index in the active region. So that means that the carriers introduce the uh, anti-wave guiding in the active region. In other layers, 
we don't have a free time. So we have a distribution of the temperature, and temp if you have a higher te temperature, you can also induce higher refractive <coughs> index. This is the distribution of the refractive index due to the distribution of the, of the, of the temperature in the structure. So you see that we, here we have a wave value, right? Because you produce a higher refractive index where, than the surroundings. So what would you expect? Now please have a look at the numbers. Here we have one order of magnitude larger than here. So that means that lowering of the refractive index by carriers is much stronger than increasing the refractive index by temperature. However, it happens only in the active region, precisely in the quantum one. Right? Because in barriers we have less number of, of free carriers. So it happens only here. The, the affection of the, of the refractive index distribution by the temperature is everywhere else. So that's why the thermal focusing is much, much stronger than lowering of the, of the refractive index by, by carriers in, in, in the active region. So in my calculations, I do not observe any uh, anti wave guiding effect due to the uh, due to the carriers in the active region. However, other groups like group of Ken Choquette can experimentally show that there is an anti-wave guiding effect induced by the carriers in the active region. But that is maybe due to the, due to the design which they are using. Maybe they have a larger active regions or, or whatever. I, I have to check it. However, in my calculations, I did not observe any, uh, any influence from from carriers on the anti wave Okay, and what we have here? Here we have an uh, array with three emitters. Here we have both electrons, so this is the view from the top. And here we have all those modes which appear in the structure. Here we have the emitted wavelength. Here we have a current. So if we increase the current, we increase the temperature in the structure, and we observe that all, all the emitted, uh, that all the emitted wavelength is increasing. That's because of the increase of the temperature. <coughs> and here is not a big deal. Here we have, here we have a model gain. Sorry, it should be fluid. I don't know. So the model gain is here. So here we have a distribution of the model gain. If, a, if mode has a large model gain, then we can expect that this is the mode which, which, which is That means that loss of the threshold, we can observe three of them. This is epsilon zero one. Uh, oh, again, that's that's, uh, that's now the nodes. No? Sorry. That's now the nodes. Now, now there are the nodes, right? Thank you. <laughs> so epsilon zero zero. This is what what was shown as a epsilon one one. Sorry for that. So here we have a mode with one lobe, two lobes, and three lobes. They are very very close to each other due to the due to the model gain. Then we have a bunch of other modes which are quite far due to the, due to the model gain. So most probably we will not, not observe all of them for, for lower currents. If we increase the current, then we see that some modes start to uh, approach to that group. Right. Of course, there is, there is such a behavior uh, uh, that, 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 that we are lowering <coughs> the model gain if we increase the threshold current. That's due to my model, which is not fully self-consistent. And what we see here, we see that if we increase the current, we increase the temperature, which means that we decrease the gain, right? Because we have a shift of the gain with the temperature. So that's why the model gain of, the, of, of, of all those modes is decreasing. However, what we will observe is that we are observing three modes, and then maybe we will observe the another uh, third mode. Right? And if we increase more the current, there maybe will be a fifth mode. And we see more uh, modes here. So again, here we have a wavelength again against current. And of course, we see the same that the wavelength is increasing with the temperature. But here in the threshold, we already have four modes. And there are more modes which are approaching to the group. 
However, in that region, the dominating mode is that one. So this is our array mode, right? So here we have four emitters, and this is the mode with four lobes, which are in, 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 in those emitters. So everything is fine and understandable. But here, that mode is not anymore uh, uh, dominating. This is, this is that one. It's, it's going very low. According to others, like for example that one, which is epsilon 1 pi. So we have a five lobes. So why that mode is stronger than that one for higher currents? This is why. Here we have a distribution of our array mode and that guy who appears for higher currents. So we see that it overlaps very well with emitters. And that one, not very well. Right? We see that, that we have a lobes barely at the pixels. And that one is uh, exactly between. So it suffers a huge, huge absorption. If we increase the current, we increase the thermal focusing. If we increase the thermal focusing, we see that the, that mode becomes more squashed. So it is out of the pixels, and the higher order modes start to uh, uh, be confined just in the pixels, and those, pic and those lobes in between became smaller. There's also another, another behavior which, which appears for uh, distribution of a refractive index. If you have a distribution of a refractive index like that, that you have maximum here and it lowers here, so here you will have a <coughs> larger amplitude. So here the lobes will be stronger than both ones. So if you fulfill such a condition that both lobes are in the place of, of both pixels, then you can expect that this is the mode which, which will show a high, high model gain. All right, so we see that such array is, is very sensitive to the, to the temperature. So what we can do to make that it is not any more sensitive to the, to the temperature distribution? Of course, we have to introduce some refractive index. Why not? Okay, so since we are glue those DPRs to the cavity, so in the technological process we have a nice access to the cavity. So why not to do some sculpture in the, in the cavity? So we can dig something, like for example, something like that. That's empty space, that's air. What is air? Air is the insulator, but also air, this is a material of low refractive index, which is one, right? So we are introducing the, the wave rate effect here. So we are introducing such a air patterning which is correlated to, the, to, the, to those tunnel junctions. Right? This is the view from the top. So here we have that patterning, and here below we have those tunnel junctions. And we want to force those modes to be just in, the, in, in those pixels, where we have a tunnel junction, so where we have a high uh, uh, carrier concentration, which means that we have large gain. Right? So we want to force them to be there, nowhere else. And to be independent on the, on the, on the uh, uh, temperature distribution. Why independent? Because it introduces a strong refractive index contrast. Again, this is one and this is three. What introduces the, the, the temperature distribution? It introduces the difference of the refractive index, which is around uh, 0.01 or something like that. So it's much weaker wave guiding effect. Here is wavelength, and this is, the, and this is the etching depth. So what I'm doing here is that I'm uh, uh, digging deeper and deeper. So I'm introducing stronger and stronger waveguiding effect. So on the beginning, we have four modes. This is more or less what we had before. It's, it it's also depends how many modes we have here. It also depends on the distance between the, uh, the, the pixels. So I didn't show before what's happening if we have different distance between the pixels. So we are increasing the etching depth and we are reducing the emitted wavelength. This is the effect which is also observed in the oxide lasers. So if you have the, the uh, uh, oxide aperture, so if you shrink it, or if you make thicker, you always 
lowering the, the emitted wavelength. So you, are, you observe a typical blue sheet. Right? And what else? We see that if we etching deeper and deeper, we observe uh, new modes which appear because we are introducing stronger wave guiding effect. If we have strong wave guiding effect, then we can have more modes. Mm -hmm. Doesn't that introduce also problems with losses? Because you might get, if you edge there really these air gaps, uh, mm -hmm. and surface defects and other things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is not included. What is included here is diffraction. Of course, it, it introduces some diffraction, but everything depends, and scattering. It is also, mm -hmm. right? So all our surfaces are just flat and, and, mm -hmm. and we have angles like 90 degrees. So there are no additional effects out of the scattering and, and diffraction. But you are right. There are some additional uh, losses which, which, which are due to the technological issues. Okay. But what is also interesting that both modes which appear here, and if we increase the etching depth, the distance due to the emitted wavelength between both modes becomes smaller, and they group into in my case, four groups, but there might be other modes which also create such uh, such, uh, such image, like, like, like here. Right? So what happens here? Here we have both modes if we have no etching. So this is our fundamental mode, the first order mode, second order mode. And if we increase the etching, we see that the fundamental mode is located in, in, the, in, in the central pixel. That mode is located in the outer pixel. But what happened to that one? What happened with the lobe inside? It disappeared. Okay. Oops. Let's go further. So here we have another mode, another gallery of the mode. And what is happening if we increase the etching depth? Again, we see the same, right? This is that guy which was here. So that guy had already four lobes. And here we can observe barely two. Here we have two lobes, and here we have two lobes as well. Four lobes, four lobes. Some, oh, that one. Here disappeared those, those lobes here. So what is, what is happening here? Like that, and like that. So you can see that those lobes are located or in the central pixel or in the outer pixels. There is no other option. So, let's track our, our array mode. This is the guy right here. If we, in, if we increase the etching depth, we see that those lobes which are here start to be dominated. Right? So that one is, is, is dumped. This is another story. <coughs> we have that situation. So that's the issue which is, which is interesting to, 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 to analyze, because maybe this is due to the symmetry. This is the open question. Why, why it behaves like that? That, that? that if we have a strong confinement, we have our, our uh, central mode fulfilled with the mode or outer modes, but not all of them. Of course, what you observe in the experiment, you observe that every pixel is fulfilled, because the, the spectral distance between both modes is almost nothing, right? So what you observe in the experiment, you observe uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, uh, 12, 12 lobes in, 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 such, a, in such a structure. Right? Because the spectral distance between that, lobe, that mode and that mode is almost zero. So it's, it's difficult to, to extract them in the, in the experimental way. So I can see only in the numerics that both are different modes. Okay. But what is happening with the model gain? This is our model gain against the etching depth. That's a mess. Right? So here we have both three modes of the beginning. We increase the, the etching depth. So the model gain is, is increasing. So that means that we have a lower losses. Why, why do we have lower losses? Because we can find the modes. It's, it's simple, right? So the modes are just in the place where we have a, a gain. So we, we, we will have a higher model gain, although there might appear stronger scattering or, or stronger diffraction, whatever. But first of all, we, we force 
those modes to be in the place where is a game. So that's why they are gaming. And we see that all the modes behave in the same way. So this is not a good approach to achieve a single mode vixen array. Right? Because what we do by, by introducing the, the waveguiding, we collect all, all of the modes. So what is happening here, I, I, I try to, to, to reproduce the, the spectrum, like from the spectrum analyzer. So here we have a wavelength, here we have a model gain, which uh, close to the threshold uh, corresponds to the, to the density of emitted power by, 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 by the modes. So here, here we have a spectrum for the edging depth, which is equal to zero. And we increase the edging depth. So what we observe, we observe a blue shift. So that means that the modes go goes that way, and there start to appear another modes, and we see the broadening of the spectrum. So if we introduce the stronger confinement factor, a stronger uh, confinement, we, of course, are sure that the modes are just in the place where we have a gain. <coughs> so we have a efficient interaction between photons and, and electrons. It is independent on the temperature. The change of the, of the current cannot change the distribution of the modes like it was before. So we will not observe any, any squeezing of the modes, right? The modes will be just in the pixels. However, there will be a huge number of the modes and the spectrum will be very broad. And this is also interesting because if we I introduce a deep etching, that means that the mm, mm, uh, modes became independent. So there is like uh, no uh, sending the information between the modes. Like, 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 like you shift the emitters very far. So what you expect, you expect that each uh, emitter will emit <coughs> like a single pixel. So this is what, what, what we see here. This is the spectrum of a single pixel because single pixel here has a fundamental mode, this first order mode, second order mode, and so on and so on. So we are, if we're introducing deep etching, that we are making the, the, the pixels independent. So this is not a good way. So still, we are looking, because I, I would like to come back to the introduction. We are looking for only one mode, which has a, 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 a lobes, one lobe per one pixel, and they are in place. So still, we are looking for that. And we notice that very good approach due to the, just introducing tan junction, which produces high emitted power in a single mode, failed for arrays, right? Because it, it, it was very sensitive to the temperature. Uh, also failed by introducing of a waveguiding effect, because then we collect the modes. We have many of them, and it's impossible to, to, to produce a single mode operation by, by such an approach. So what else? If we cannot introduce a, a, a low refractive index on the sides, so maybe let's introduce the low refractive index in the center. And then we have the anti-waveguiding effect. So we have an array. Again, those are those standard junctions, and, and we know that. Before here, we had both edges. But right now, we have the islands with low refractive uh, index uh, material. That's the another I issue if you can do it or not. But somehow we can do it. Never mind. We can introduce the lower refractive index or, or we can etch it. However, with etching, there are some, some problems. We have very strong scattering and um, in simulations, I cannot get a, a nice distribution of the modes if we just etch it. So maybe this is the matter of a, a high contrast of the refractive index. But on the other hand, in vexels, it works. So that's, that's the issue which I still have, which I still need to dig. All right. So right now, we have a low refractive index here. So how can we confine the mode in, in such a structure? Right? Because we can confine the mode if we have a high refractive index in the center and low refractive index on the, on the side. All right, but here, this is the, the optical field. This is the solution of the Maxwell equation. And probably you know that effective, uh, that, uh, effective index method works. It even works for very complicated structures and the effective index method is based on the uh, independent solution in that direction and in that direction. So that means that we can treat the light like this is standing wave, not only here, 
but it may be a standing wave also here. So why not? Why not to produce a standing wave here? Right? We have we have periodic structure here. So this is the matter only to find a proper distance between those emitters and 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 size of of those pixels. That's the solution. So mass again. <coughs> Here is a wavelength, very varies a distance between the emitters. So here we have, okay, epsilon one one I, I did, did not observe. So I observed only, uh -huh, again, here I have the proper uh, 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 proper labeling of the modes. So there is a mode <coughs> with, with two lobes, three lobes, four lobes, and so on. So, so we see that this is such a behavior that, it in, that the wavelength increases. But maybe there are such some steps or, or some some I don't know uh, places where the wavelength is not changing very strongly and then it's changing very strongly. Here we have again the distance between the emitters, but here we have a model game. So we, this is what 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 we are looking for. We are looking for the, the to, to find the, the the difference between the one mode and the another. Okay. That's a mess, so let's do it step by step. Let's choose one of them, epsilon one nine. So this is that guy which we are looking for. So this is that mode which we expect that will have a proper lobes in the in the pixels, right? And they will be in phase. This is the change of the of the wavelength. So this is not 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 such a nice curve as it was be before. So we see that even here might be some. Uh, uh, lack of the continuity. <coughs> it's like it's like a jumping between maybe one distribution and the another distribution. We will see. And here we see how the model gain is changing. So we see that for some distance, the model gain <coughs> is quite high. So in in that case, we can expect that it will be a dominating mode. But why? Okay, we, I change the scale. And here I'm showing the distribution of that mode. So it should have a nine lobes. One, two, three, four, nine. It's nine. All right. We are here. Distance between the emitters, we are just on the beginning, right? So we see that there are three pixels and there are uh, three lobes by the pixel. We are changing the distance between the emitters. So this is the blue line. So this is what we're, where we are. We are changing the distance and we see that there is a change of the distribution. Particularly, we have a strong leakage here, and lobes from the center disappear. And also, before we had three lobes per, per pixel, and now we have two lobes. Let's go further. It modifies again, and now we are approaching to such a situation that we have very small leakage. There is no lobe here. Well, maybe there is one, and there are two lobes in the pixels. So this is the situation where we confine the mode. We are changing the distance and we see that there is a modification of the of the mode. Again we have a strong leakage again. So that means that there is some strong modification of the mode and it confines to such a situation that again here before we have we had no lobe here but right now we have a lobe here. There is there are two lobes in the in the pixels and one of them is trying to escape from that pixel. So we are approaching to the situation where we have a high model gain. Why do we have a high model gain? Because we are approaching to the situation where, where we have only one pixel per, sorry, one, one lobe per, per pixel. So all other lobes are here in between. So you can see those, those wavy behavior here. So those are the lobes which we observed before, but right now they are in between. Kind of Sorry, sorry again. The boundary conditions of the simulation. Ah, yeah. The boundary condition here is that we have a P PML. This is the, the absorbing boundary condition. So, well, uh, you sh we should not observe any reflections from here, but it's not perfectly working. So that's why you you may see that uh, uh, that leakage is in that direction and in that direction. There is no no leakage like here. But we check it, and uh, due to the numerical values, it has no affection. Mm -hmm. So the total effect of the leakage is the same. Right? If, 
if we if we considering in the square or in the uh, <coughs> So it seems that finally we found that guy which we were looking for. So we are in phase. Each lobe is in, the, in phase. We have a rather low model gain, right? So probably this is that, that mode. We go further, and what we see, we see again the last modification, which is like that, that both lobes here became smaller. And <clears throat> okay, here we have a largest model gain. So uh, that means that that mode has a lowest losses. But from the other side, from the side which I did not include in my calculations, is that that to achieve a largest emitted power, you need to fulfill such a condition that uh, you have a large. Uh, Mm, optical power in each pixel. So it can strongly interact with electrons. If you have small uh, small number of photons here and here, you will have smaller uh, 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 stimulated emission. Right? So what you have to fulfill, you have to fulfill roughly, uh, rather equal distribution of the optical field in each pixel. So what I expect, I expect that that distance can assure the largest emitted power. Although this is not the largest uh, model game. Right? So we go further and further, and we do such a situation that that mode becomes destroyed. It is confined by the waveguiding uh, effect. So it happens to, to all of the modes, and we can track track like that, all of them. But those colored ones are both the modes which we are looking for. So those are in-phase modes, which can produce a, a, a nice far field with, with, one, with one lobe in the far field. And here, this is the curve which corresponds to the maximal, <coughs> maximal model gain. doesn't matter what, what is the mode, right? I want to just to have a maximal model gain. And here we have a model gain of the second mode. So thanks to that, I can find the distance between first and second mode. So it gives the, the difference of the model gain. If, so again, if we have a large difference of the model gain, we can expect that it can be a single mode uh, device. And I draw it. So I draw it, the, the model gain, against the distance between the emitters, so that axis, it is exactly what was before, but here we have the aperture size, sorry. The aperture size, so this is, uh, okay. So this is size of a pixel. So here I change the size of a pixel. And, I, and we see that the size of the pixel also influences the model gain. So we have the largest model gain for such, such, a, such an up, uh, aperture. And if we change the distance, we see both regions of higher and lower uh, uh, model gain. Here we have a model gain discrimination, so that means that this is a difference between first and second. So those are the regions where we have the domination of those modes which are looking for, and those regions here, those are the regions where we have a strong discrimination as well. So we can expect that here we can find the design which will produce the fundamental mode, and we will have a nice far field. So <clears throat> due to that, that, that behavior with respect to the aperture, I calculate the single emitter with, with anti-wave guiding effects. So we ha I have only uh, uh, one pixel with lower refractive index. So it should push out the, the mode out, out, of the, out, out of that region with low, refra with low refractive index. But it's not. So that means that here we have some resonance between the, the interfaces between lower and higher refractive index. And we see it here. This is a model gain. If we increase the aperture, so we see that the model gain is increasing. And we have some maximum for 6 microns. And again, the maximum for 
for, for, for nine microns. So it is a, a fingerprint of some resonance between those interfaces. And also it's, it's strongly uh, discriminating uh, 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 confinement because in that region I, I couldn't find the first order mode. This is like just a single mode uh, structure completely. I do not see any higher order modes. They are, however, they are not confined. If we increase the, the aperture, then we start to see the, the, the first order mode. But this is because of that, that it looks like that. Right? So we need a broader aperture to have a res resonance. So, so, this one. so to conclude, it seems that to have the, the single mode array, we cannot go in the way of, of, of waveguiding mechanics. We need uh, the anti waveguiding mechanisms to, to, to find the fundamental mode. And we are basing mostly on the phenomena of standing mode in the lateral position. So, so it seems that pixel arrays, single mode pixel arrays, are the devices with a standing wave not only in, in, in the, in the uh, vertical direction, but also in the horizon, horizon layers. So thank you for your patience. Thank you very much, Dominic. Questions, comments? I may start. Um, I was just wondering uh, whether I, I missed something. As, as a guiding and anti guiding mm -hmm. mechanism, you, you consider the terminal one, you consider the one by the carriers, and then the introduced one by the structure. Mm -hmm. What about the detuning between? Uh, the emission wavelength and the, uh, and the chemical resonance. Does that enter at some point as well? Because this effective detuning introduces guiding or anti-guiding as well. No, y y well, yes, because we uh, uh, bec because we have a resonance due to the due to the cavity, right? This is one thing. And if I understand you well, we have also the the, the, the spectral gain distribution, right? So. Everything is, is uh, so it's, it's, it's included. Yes, it's you included. try to take use of it. For example, you put by design and have a certain no. tuning. No, 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 no. However, I'm working here on. Mm. We have a wavelength, and if I'm right, the gain uh, the spectral gain looks like. More or less like, like that, right? We are working here. So this is our resonance. So if we increase the current, we increase the temperature and it shifts here, right? So we are more and more in, 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 in that region because the gain shifts faster than, than, uh, than the resonance wavelength. And particularly in, in those lasers, we have five quantum wells which are very non-uniform, but it was not intention of the, uh, of the lab. If they are not uniform, the distribution of the gain is not as high as, as it is here, but it's much broader. But it's high enough. So that means that you can uh, uh, change the uh, operational uh, conditions, you can change the temperature, and still you have a lasing. So they, they observe lasing for very high temperatures. And the threshold does not change drastically with the temperature. Because typically what, what we observe, this is the threshold current against heat sink temperature. And typically this is like that. In both lasers, we have such behavior. This is because of the very broad gain spectrum. The effect of the etching depth, this is maybe an effect of actually the distance um, to the quantum wells and the depth. Do you consider that? But what would be the, uh, the effect? Uh, I don't know, diffraction maybe? Of the uh, well, that does not. Uh, well, uh, on one hand side, you, you, are, you are right that if we are close, in, uh, that if we are close to, the, to the quantum wells, we have a higher intensity of the light. So all the, defect, all the effects will be stronger, like, for example, diffraction. Right? 
So if we are increasing the etching depth, we can expect the stronger diffraction. Yes, it is, but there is a stronger effect, which is a stronger confinement. Mm -hmm. And so diffraction is included in my model, okay. but we see mm -hmm. that the dominant effect is, is, confined, is confined. But OK, I did not calculate it for, for very deep etchings. So what I calculated, here, here are our quantum wells, and this is our etching. So I etched up to the to the anti uh, mm, anti node position, right? So it was a node position, and here is anti node position. So I was etching up to the to the place where we have the strongest interaction between the the, the uh, etching and the and the field. But of course, if we are if we are etching deeper and deeper, so we will not see any more any increase in the model gain, but we will uh, see the decreasing. So again, it will be a, a, like a periodic behavior. Yeah. So this is our uh, uh, capital G is <coughs> capital G is a model gain, and this is the etching depth. So this is model gain which is increasing. We go to the uh, 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 to that place. This is maximum, and it goes lower. And we have minimum if we are if we are in the node position. And then we go to the maximum, which is let's say here, but it's lower. It's lower than that one because of the diffraction. And and indeed, I I, I was observing that. However, I didn't want to go to such a deep etching because of the diffraction, but also due to the problems with the current injection. Right, because you are leaving not, 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 not much space for, for the current flow to the to the Thank you very much. There's more questions, people are hungry, it seems. Let's thank Tomek. Thank you.